I'm just going to briefly go through some basics of copyright and trademark, and please do jot down your questions. Again, I'll be more than happy to answer them at lunchtime. So a brief disclaimer before I get started, and that is that the information that I'm presenting is based on legal principles. It's based on federal law. Depending on what state you're living in, different laws may apply. So these are just general principles. And I say that to say that I'm not giving any specific legal advice. Even if I answer your question, please don't go back to your local church and say, well, my attorney told me I can do A, B, C, and D. No, if you have a question, contact your own legal counsel, or you can email me at the General Conference, and then I can answer your question more specifically and maybe give you some actual legal guidance. But this is just a presentation to give you some information. So let's start with copyrights. What is a copyright? A copyright is a set of rights that are granted to creators or authors of original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible form of expression. And the language here is taken actually from the copyright statute. So it's, it's very, in the US, there's a very strict definition of what qualifies as a copyright and what doesn't. So there are certain works that can be copyrighted, and those include books, um, computer software, musical works, um, dramas, even architectural works and sound recordings. But there are also things that can't be copyright protected, such as ideas or facts. Um, the, the two elements that have to be present is it has to be an original work of authorship and has to be in a fixed form of expression. So just make sure that it's meeting both of those um, elements. So a copyright holder has the following rights. They have the right to copy, to distribute, to publicly perform, to display and to make derivatives of their work. And this is important because only the copyright owner has these rights. These are exclusive rights. So without permission, you can't do any of these things with, with a copyrighted work. For example, an owner uh, can decide whether they want to let someone use a photograph in a magazine or an album cover or simply to sell it for profit. Or they can say, I've taken this photo and I don't want to let anyone use it for any of these reasons. They have that right. So how do you get a copyright? Well, a copyright is obtained automatically when an original work of authorship, again, is fixed in a tangible form of expression. And registration with the Copyright Office is not required, but there are benefits. Now, what this means is that prior to 1978, um, people actually did have to register their works. And sometimes you'll see that little C symbol, you know what I'm talking about, the little C? Um, and that would indicate that something was copyrighted and that it was registered. These days, you don't have to put that symbol next to anything. It makes it a little bit confusing, though, when you're searching the web to try to find um, items that are in public domain, because you can't really tell based on there being a C or not. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I just wanted to, to make that point um, early on. So again, registration is not required, but here are some of the benefits of copyright registration. It establishes a public record. So if you go to the Copyright Office website and you want to do a search, you can find those um, items, those works, that someone has registered with the Copyright Office. It's fairly inexpensive, it costs a couple hundred dollars, and then your work is there for people to see that, it's, that it belongs to you. Um, also, if you want to file an infringement lawsuit in federal court, you have to register the work first. And one of the other benefits is it allows you to then register your copyrighted work with the US Customs Service so that they can protect against the importation of infringing works. So who owns the copyright? Well, the author or cre creator of the work, or if you want to assign that right to someone, like your children or other beneficiaries, you can assign them the rights to your copyrighted work. Or under a work for hire agreement, an employer or one who commissioned the work is actually the legal holder of the copyright. So let's talk about what a work for hire is. A work for hire is actually defined, again, in the copyright statute, which is, which is in Title 17 of the U.S. Code. And there are certain elements that have to be present for it to qualify as a work for hire. One, the work either has to be prepared by an employee who is acting within the scope of his or her employment. So let's say that you um, own a business and you have a graphic artist that is employed as part of that business, and they work from 9 to 5. The work that they're doing during that time for your company belongs to the company. But if they're doing work outside of office hours and outside of the scope of their employment, that work belongs to them. Now, we run into this issue sometimes at the General Conference when we have people come in as ministry directors and they own works that they had created prior 
to becoming a ministry director. And they say, hey, we can just use it for the ministry. And I say, no, not so fast. You need to have an agreement because you, are, you the individual, owns the material, not the general conference. So again, it has to be created during the scope of employment um, to be a work for hire under that condition. The second way it can become a work for hire is if it's a work that's specifically ordered or commissioned by like, you, you know, you hire an independent contractor to maybe do some design for you or to work on a book for you. But in order for that to qualify as a work for hire, it has to be, it has to be fall under one of these um, very limited um, uses, such as it can be a translation, a test, <coughs> material for the answer to a test, an atlas, um, instructional text, or supplementary work, which means like a foreword or um, preface to a book. It's very limited what actually qualifies as a work for hire under statute. On top of that, even if the work does come within one of those categories, there has to be a written agreement that is signed by both parties that specifically says that the work is being created as a work for hire. Without that language, it again doesn't qualify as a work for hire and the person that created the work is the owner, not the person who commissioned it. So what we always advise people to do is to add the following language into the agreements that they um, enter into with independent contractors. And that language is, to the extent that the work product is not recognized as a work made for hire as a matter of law, the contractor hereby assigns to the company any and all copyrights in and to the work product. This is an assignment. So basically it's saying, even if it doesn't qualify as a work for hire, I'm still giving you my rights. That's just um, advisable so that you can still retain the, the copyright if you want it. So what is copyright infringement? Copyright infringement is when someone uses a whole or a part of copyrighted material without permission. This can include ad adaptations of copyrighted material, um, changing an image or changing lyrics without permission. Um, recreating an image even. And it also includes use beyond the scope of a license. So if I give you the right to perform a song and then you want to webcast your performance, you have gone beyond the scope of the license I gave you. You have infringed on my copyright. Um, also, if you buy a CD of an artist and you want to use the music on your website, you would need to get permission. Otherwise, you've infringed. So I can go on and on with examples. But basically, unless you have specific permission to, to do something with a copyrighted work, if you go on and do it, you're infringing. So what are the penalties for infringement? Well, the US copyright law provides for um, penalties that include the actual damages of any profits that the infringer may have taken from the um, lawful owner, and also statutory damages. And statutory damages can range from $750 per infringement to no more than $30,000 for each infringing work. But if the infringement is willful, and what that means is if someone told you, hey, you're infringing on my work, and you continue to do that, then the penalties can be $150,000. And there also, there's also the potential of prison terms. Um, so hopefully that gets everyone's attention as far as copyright infringement. So here are some examples of copyright infringement. On the left, you see a uh, um, picture of President Obama. And this was taken by a, um, a photographer the, for the Associated Press. And on the right, you see the Hope poster. It was a pretty famous poster that was um, used during the 2008 campaign. And it was created by an artist named Shepard Ferry. And the photographer saw the poster and said, hey, that's based on my photograph. And they sued. And Ferry, the, the street artist, said, hey, it's, it's fair use. I don't know how many of you have heard that term, fair use, right? So it, we'll talk more about fair use, but the street artist said, hey, this qualifies as fair use. I've transformed this. It's something different. Um, well, they ended up settling, and they split the profits from the work. And one of the reasons is fair use is a very gray area, and it was not clear whether this would qualify as fair use or not, but it, it kind of was on the border of what is copyright infringement. And here's another example. There was a sculpture artist, his name was Jeff Koons, and he took, a photo, he took someone else's photograph and said, hey, I want to turn this into 3D art. And he actually lost his lawsuit. He also claimed fair use. He said, oh, this is transformative. It's something different. And the court said, no, they found that there are substantial, substantial copyrightable elements that were borrowed without permission. 
So here's another one. I'm not sure how many of you ever heard the song Blurred Lines by Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams. It was a hit in 2013. Um, but it sounded slightly similar to a song by Marvin Gaye. And Marvin Gaye's estate sued, and they said, hey, this is copyright infringement. You took elements of, of um, Marvin Gaye's song, and you made a huge profit off of it. Well, the federal court agreed, and they awarded $7.3 million to Marvin Gaye's family estate. So how do you avoid copyright infringement? Well, first, you need to determine whether the work you want to use is, in fact, copyright protected. If it isn't, you're free to use it. Do whatever you want to do with it. Copy, distribute it, make derivatives from it. But if it is copyright protected, then you need to get permission, and it needs to be in writing so you have some record that you actually do have permission. So what items don't you need copyright permission for? You don't need to get permission if the work is original. And that means if you created the work, you have all the rights. You are the copyright owner. Also, you don't need permission if the material is in public domain. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, actually, we're going to talk about each of these. Um, you don't need permission if the work qualifies as fair use. But I have a little asterisk there because fair use is a very gray area. And you don't need um, permission for works that are under a public copyright license. So public domain. Copyright is not... Um, unlimited. It, ha it lasts for a fixed period of time. And when the copyright um, expires, then it becomes in the public domain and anyone can use it. So depending on the circumstances, um, copyright lasts for different periods of time depending on who created it and when it was created. For works that were created before 1978, it, it's really all over the place. You have to know whether the work was registered, whether they renewed their registration, when they renewed their registration, whether they recorded the registration. It gets really tricky. Um, one, one rule I can say is that anything that was created before 1923 at this point is in public domain. So if you find hymns in the hymnal that are prior to 1923, you're free to use them. If they're post-1923, it's just not, you know, you need to do a little bit more research. Okay, so currently if someone creates a work, the copyright will last from 70 years after the date that the author dies, um, or 95 years from the date of the publication of the work, or 120 years from the creation of the work if the work is unpublished. And those second two, the 95 years and the 120 years, those really apply to work for hire when it's not an individual that's owning the work anymore, but an entity or a corporation or company. So the basic rule is, if someone created a work, it's 70 years after the person dies. So let's talk about fair use. Under the fair use doctrine, and again, this is found in the US copyright statute, um, use of copyrighted material is permissible for limited portions of a work, including quotes, for purposes such as commentary, criticism, news reporting, and scholarly reports. There are no clear rules defining how many words you can use or how much of a song you can use or how much of a video you can use and still fall in, under the fair use exception or what percentage of a work you can use. Instead, it's decided on a case-by-case -case basis by the court, which is why it's such a gray area. It really depends on all the circumstances. But they have given us some factors that courts will look at in determining if something qualifies as fair use or not. First, they'll look at the purpose and the character of the use. For example, am I using this work to make money? Am I using it for commercial purposes myself, or am I using it for nonprofit or educational purposes? If I'm using it for commercial nature, the courts are less likely to find fair use, but if you're using it for educational or nonprofit purposes, which I assume most of you here would be using um, a copyrighted material for, then the courts are more likely to find it to fall under fair use. They also look at the nature of the copyright at work. They look at the amount and substantiality of the portion used. So for example, if there's a two hour movie and you want to use a one minute clip, they might find that more likely to be fair use than if you're using all of a three minute song, because then you're using all of the, like the entire work. Um, and then they also look at the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. So are you taking away the original author's or original owner's ability to make profit off of their work? And if you are, the courts or are less likely to find it to be fair use. But if you're not, then the courts are more likely to find it to be fair use. But as you see, these are all factors you have to, to look at together in totality to find out whether you think your use will be fair use or not.
Was that a little bit confusing or did that make sense? If it's confusing, that's actually good because um, when I get questions about this, I can't ever really give a solid answer. It's just a, hey, look at these factors and weigh it out and you know, hopefully you won't get sued on this. Um, so here are some examples, and I, I actually um, took some cases to, to talk about. But basically, under criticism and comment, um, quoting an excerpt from a, a work or a review might qualify as fair use. News reporting, maybe summarizing an article with brief quotations that otherwise would be infringing could qualify as fair use. These are some of the examples, but I, I want to give um, some examples from case law. So a company published a book of trivia questions about the Seinfeld series. Do you all remember the Seinfeld television series? So someone took, ep they, they looked at the episodes and they made a book of trivia questions based on the characters and, and the episodes, and then they got sued. And the court found that it wasn't fair use. They found that um, they took material from the from this show, and even though it was a book, and even though it wasn't, um, they weren't taking like videos of the show itself, that they took away a potential um, market from the owners of the Seinfeld series. But in contrast, um, the makers of a movie biography of Muhammad Ali, they used 41 seconds from a boxing match in their biography, in their um, video biography. And the court found that that did qualify as fair use. So, and there are other examples of where people use two, three minutes of material and they found it to be fair use and people have used 15 seconds and the courts have found it not to be fair use. So it just, it, it kind of runs the gamut. So here's another example. If you look at the um, image on the left, this is an image that the photographer Patrick Corot made. And if you look at the image on the right, this is Patrick Rowe's image with some additions added to it by a, an artist named Richard Prince. Now, how many of you think that this would qualify as fair use, this, this transforming of the work? And how many of you think it's infringing? Infringing? Well, actually, Richard Prince is kind of like the, the I don't know, he's like the king of fair use, of, of um, reclaiming work and then making money off of it and still being okay. Like, the court found that this was actually fair use. They found that even though he took images from um, Patrick Corot and all he did was add you know, some, some color to the hands and added a guitar and put some markings over the face, they found that it was transformative and that he could sell it and make money off of it. And he's made a lot of money by doing this to artists. In fact, he takes Instagram posts because when you post something on Instagram, you're giving up some of your rights, as we'll talk about. He's taken Instagram posts and, fr and blown them up and framed them and, sell, and sold them for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he continues to do this and he claims fair use and the courts have found that it's fair use. So if you compare that to um, these examples, it doesn't really make sense. But again, fair use is just a really, really, really gray area. So let's talk about the public copyright license. How many of you have heard of Creative Commons licenses? How many of you have used Creative Commons license? Okay, so that is a type of public copyright license. And it's also known as an open copyright license. And what this is, is a, it's copyright holders that are giving permission for others to use their work in ways that would otherwise be infringing. Um, and they just kind of give a general license to anyone to use the work under certain conditions. So sites, there, here are some sites where you can find a public copyright license. You can find some of them on Flickr. A lot of the photos on Flickr will have um, the Creative Commons license with it. Wikipedia Commons is a, another source. But a note, just because something is available on Google or Google Images, that is not a Creative Commons license, okay? If you find an image on Google Images, it does not mean you are free to use that image. It still probably belongs to someone and they still probably will come after you, they will find you. So, here are types of Creative Commons license, and I, and I apologize that you can't see the images, but they have icons that, that denote what rights they're giving you. So, on the upper left-hand corner, it has like a little figure of a person, and that's the right of attribution. So, what it says is that, hey, Anyone can use my, let's say, photo. You can use my photo, you can copy it, you can distribute it, you can make derivative works from it, but you just have to give me attribution and the credits. You have to say that it was created by me, or the original, at least, was created by me. Um, another kind of license that they may give is a share-alike license, which is you can do all these things 
again, create derivatives, publicly you know, display, copy, but you have to allow others to do the same with your work if it's based off of my work. Another is non-commercial. So they're saying you, again, can do anything you want to do with this material, but you can't do it for profit. It can only be for nonprofit purposes, non-commercial purposes. And then another kind of Creative Commons license is that you can do anything with my work, but you can't create derivatives. And does everyone know what derivatives means? Derivatives means, um, like one example would be um, if someone makes a book, they create a book, and someone then wants to make a movie based on the book, that would be a derivative, right? So what they're saying is you can't, you can't modify or alter my work. You can copy it, you can distribute it, but you can't modify it. So let's talk about music permissions for a second. I'm kind of switching gears, and this is getting towards the end of the copyright portion of this, uh, of this talk. So music permission tends to get people in trouble a lot. There are a lot of different permissions for music depending on what you want to use and how you want to use it. So I'm going to go through the different kinds of licenses and different kinds of rights that people have in, um, in, their, in music. The first one is a master use license. It's also known as a dubbing license. And this covers the actual recorded version of a song. So um, this is if you want a particular artist's version of even Amazing Grace, which is Amazing Grace itself is in public domain, but if you want a particular artist's version of it that was recorded, you would need to get a master use license to, uh, to use that, that song. Um, then you have performance rights. How many of you are aware of like ASCAP, BMI, CSAC? Okay, so that covers the public performance of a work. Typically, you can't perform a work in public unless you have the rights to do so. Private performance is different, but public performance, including in church, but we'll talk about that, um, you typically need a license to do. So you'd get that license through a PRO, it's called a Performance Rights Organization, and BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC are the big ones. Those are the ones that cover the vast majority of songs in the United States. Um, another kind of right that applies to music is a mechanical license. And this is if you want to um, reproduce a song, um, this is where you get your reproduction rights, such as if you want to make a DVD of, of, of um, a certain song that's copyright protected. And to get the permission to do this, you need to work with a rights society or a publisher. Um, and the big one is Harry Fox Agency. They're the ones that are really big in mechanical licenses. And the last one is a sync license. And this, I think, is one that you all may um, need, to pay, need to pay attention to. So if you want to use a, a, a piece of music, and synchronize it with moving pictures or with photographs as background music, you actually have to have a sync license, okay? So it covers the composition and the lyrics of a song, um, and it's different than a performance license. Like, as soon as you start to link music with picture, you need this license in place. So that's just, you know, one to keep in mind. People like to do DVDs or they like to do um, video presentations and put music you know, attached to it. But unless you have the rights to the music, you, you're really not supposed to do that. So how do we get permission to use music? The first step is to gather all the information about the song you want to use. You want to get the name of the song, the, the writer and the composer, the publisher, the record label, because these are people that you may need to contact to get permission. The next step is you may want to determine what type of permission you need. Um, is the work, whether you need permission, I'm sorry, is the work completely original? Um, is the work an arrangement? Do you need to get permission from multiple people? Is the work in the public domain where you wouldn't need to get any permission? And then you need to request the necessary permissions. Do you need a performance license? Do you need a master use license? Do you need a sync license? And then you just reach out to um, the, in the individuals. It may be the writer composer you need to reach out to or the publisher or the record label. You reach out, you ask them, they'll give you a price. Or they may say, hey, you can use it for free. But, you know, if they give you a price, you determine, is it worth this amount of money to use a song? And if it's not, you keep moving. Well, there are places that are similar to, like, stock photo. They have, like, stock music. And those are often good sources for people that want to use background music or, or have a, a sync license. Um, but um, we can talk about that during, during lunch. So let's talk about specifically music and church. Now, under the copyright statute, there is an exception for music that's used in religious services. So it states that the performance of a non-dramatic literary or musical work 
or of a dramatical musical work of a religious nature or a display of a work in the course of service at a place of worship or other religious assembly shall not constitute copyright infringement. What does this mean? This means that if you are performing music, whether it's someone performing special music or the congregation singing together, and it's during the course of religious service, you don't need to get these permissions. You have an exemption. But it does not apply to streaming. If your church streams your service and you include music during that streaming, this exception in the copyright statute doesn't cover that. Or if your, if your church says, hey, we want to use this, these projectors and put the words up on the projectors, this exception doesn't copy that. You're infringing. Or if your church wants to perform music outside of the religious service, again, it doesn't, cop it doesn't cover that. So there are some companies that have um, come up with licenses to allow churches to do some of these things that churches typically want to do. And the two big ones are CCS and CCLI. So CCS has um, two main licenses. They have a perform music license, and this covers performances. And you may say, well, I already have an exemption under the copyright statute for, for performing music during religious service. Well, this really covers when you want to perform music outside of religious service. So let's say that you um, work for a school and they have a talent show or whatnot, and you want to be able to cover the music there. Um, or if you know, there's some churches that have cafes or coffee houses and they want music streaming, this CCS license could cover that for them. And then they have a worship cast license. And this is really, the, to, in my opinion, the more important of the two. It covers streaming. So it allows you to stream your um, musical performances during church online without um, infringing. And CCLI also has some uh, licenses that are useful to a lot of churches. Um, the big one is the copyright license. It allows you to then print the lyrics. And that includes um, re retyping them and putting them on projectors because, again, even if you have the rights to the hymnal or you, know, you have a hymnal so people can sing out of it, it doesn't give you the right to then copy the lyrics and post them online or post them on the screen. You really have to have a license to do that, and CCLI will allow you to do that. But make sure if you're using a CCLI license that you put your license number at the bottom. That's one of the terms and conditions of use. Uh, a lot of churches that I've been to, they say they have a license and they're not actually complying with the license that they have. Um, CCLI also has a song select um, service. It helps you do a music search. Uh, and then they have a church video license. So they have some videos and movies that then you can access and use as part of your church service. And the last one is they also have a streaming license in place that allows you to, to stream um, music, musical performances during your service. So the last topic I want to talk about on the copyright side is copyright and social media. So it's important to be sure that um, you are not reposting copyrighted material, because even though you weren't the original one posting the material, reposting still subjects you to those copyright infringement penalties that we talked about earlier. And also, be careful. Read the terms and conditions before you post material to, to social media sites because you're probably, not even probably, you are giving up some of your right, ownership rights when you post material on um, social media sites such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, others. I've just taken two examples of terms and conditions, one from Facebook and one from Twitter. I want to read them to you just to give you an idea of the rights that you're giving up when you post material there. So Facebook says, you grant us a non-exclusive, transferable, sub-licensable, royalty-free, worldwide license to use any IP content that you post on or in connection with Facebook, which basically means you're telling Facebook, here, this material is yours. You can do with it what you want. It also says, it means that you are allowing everyone, including people off of Facebook, to access and use that information. So when you're posting photos or you're posting material, you're basically telling everyone, hey, here, use this information, it's yours. Um, Twitter has similar language. It says, you grant us a worldwide, non-exclusive, royalty-free license with the right to sublicense to use, copy, reproduce, process, adapt, modify, publish, transmit, display, and distribute such content in any and all media or distribution methods, and it even includes now known or later developed. So if they develop some other way of distributing information, you've already given Twitter the right to do that. So that's just you know, something to be aware of. I'm not saying don't post to social media, just saying post wisely. So here are some things to remember on the copyright side. 
Just because something is available on the internet, it does not mean that it is in the public domain, okay? Secondly, just because you don't see the, the little C symbol next to a work, it does not mean that it is no longer protected by copyright. That used to be the case, but it is not the case anymore. If you get permission for one use, it doesn't mean that you have permission for all uses. This really comes, um, comes into play when we have inter-ministries, like you know, different departments that want to use the same material, or one department says, hey, well, women's ministry used this, so we have the right to use it too. No, not necessarily. It depends on what license was entered into. Um, and then lastly, mere ownership of a book or painting or, or recording does not give you the copyright. It just means that you have a copy of it. It doesn't mean that you have all the rights that come along with copyright. So here are some best practices. If something is copyright protected, get permission. Um, and use the phrase when you've gotten permission, when you're using someone else's work, use the phrase, phrase uh, reprint it with permission, um, give attribution to the original owner, that's always a nice thing to do. And you know, if you don't want to have to go through all of that, search for works that are in the public domain. Then you don't have to do any of that because the work is free to use. Also, pay close attention to the terms and conditions of use. See if the license has an expiration date or not. See if it's for as long as you want to use the work or that you can use the work for two years. Um, see if, if it's an exclusive license or a non-exclusive license because those two terms mean they have very different implications. See if you have the right to sub-license. Um, because if you don't have the right to sub-license, then children's ministry can't give women's ministry the right to use the material that they have the rights to. And then see if there are any restrictions on like media. Say, it may say you can use this in print material, but not online. And if you want the rights to be able to use something in print and online, then that restriction is not going to get the job done that you want. Um, we've had this issue come up a number of times of one department thinking that because they have the right to use something that every department has the right to use it. That's just really a big one, so I just want to kind of keep reiterating that one. Unless the license was um, entered into broadly by like the head of the organization, if a department gets a license, it's just for that one department. So some more best practices. Show good faith, provide credit or attribution where possible. Um, if you're linking something online, provide the link so people can go back to the original um, content. Um, make sure that if, you're, if something's falling under fair use, that it actually is falling under fair use. Make sure you go through all those different factors that the court looks at and that you're on the, on the clear for each of those. And then if you have any questions, you know, contact your legal counsel because they're there to help you. So this is a cautionary tale. This is not the only time this has happened, but it, it's an example of what happens. So there's a ministry at the GC. They want to make a PowerPoint on healthy eating because they think this is a great idea for, you know, to encourage people to live healthy. And they go online and they find images. And they find an image very similar to this one. I use this one because it's actually in public domain. I didn't want to use the one that the ministry actually used. Um, so they take this image and they put it on their PowerPoint. They do their presentation. And then they put their PowerPoint on their website. And it sits there, buried. No one's looking at this PowerPoint, you know, but it's, it's there because they have it in their archives. Years later, years go by, and then they receive this, the infringement letter. They, and they receive this letter saying that they used the photo without permission, that they're infringing, that the infringement at this point will become willful, which subjects them to a penalty of how much? $150,000, right, and the potential of prison terms. And then they say, hey, you owe us this much money, and we need you to enter into a license with us. And of, of course, it's some you know, ridiculously high fee, multiple thousands of dollars for this one little image that's part of one PowerPoint slide that's embedded. But because it's been on the website for like six years at this point, they say, you've been infringing for six years, using our photo for six years. And the ministry said, but this other ministry used it. Well, they had a license and this ministry didn't. So the letter comes to me, we end up having to do negotiations, having to pay something. What people don't realize is that there are um, organizations and companies out there that control and look for images, and they can find them deeply embedded in your, in your website. They can find things that you don't even know that you have still. And unless you um, delete all the information from the page or you know, take everything off, they'll find it and it's actually legitimate. You have been infringing, you will owe the money. If, if it did go to court, you probably would lose. So 
I give that as a cautionary tale for two reasons. One, to say make sure that when you're posting something, you actually have the permission, but also it's not wise to leave stuff up on your website forever. Kind of clean stuff off from time to time because someone else will find it. So let's talk briefly about trademarks and then we'll uh, have time for questions. So what is a trademark? A trademark is a distinctive word or phrase or logo or a sign that identifies certain goods or services that are produced by a specific individual or organization or company. So it's to link, you know, you see, an, you see a logo and you say, oh, that belongs to such and such. So it's to give some brand recognition. And there are two um, elements that must be present for a trademark. It has to be distinctive and it has to be used in commerce. So here are some examples of trademarks. You have the, the name Nike, World Cup, Coca-Cola, I'm loving it. And you have these images here to the side, the, the Apple image. Um, even the color pink for this um, Owens Corning, they have trademarked that color because they say when someone sees that color pink, they're going to think of our company, of our, our brand, of the quality of our product. The, the rings for the Olympic um, Committee, the Just Do It and the swoosh symbol, the McDonald's arches, those are all registered trademarks. Even the color that um, Tiffany blue, they've trademarked that color because that's Tiffany blue. That's no one else's blue, that's Tiffany's. Um, the shape of a Coca-Cola bottle, that's another one that's, um, that's trademarked. But that's not just the doorbell, that's um, NBC. They trademarked that sound because they say, hey, when people hear that, they're going to know it's an NBC program coming on. No one else's. Most of the broadcasting companies have their own little trademark signs, um, sounds, but I just wanted to show that you can really trademark a whole host of things. Anything that will identify a product or service with a particular company can be trademarked. So what are the benefits of registering your trademark federally? Well, it gives you the nationwide right to use the mark. Um, it gives nationwide constructive notice to others that this mark belongs to you. So again, um, as with copyright, you can go onto the USPTO, the US Patent and Trademark Office website, and you can do a search to see which marks belong to which companies. And if you search for the NBC Chimes, you'll then see that it belongs to NBC Universal, blah, 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 blah. Um, it will give all the information about their mark and what goods and services it falls under. It allows someone to recover treble damages or attorney's fees in addition to other remedies for um, trademark infringement. That means they can recover three times the amount of damages they could normally recover if the trademark is registered. Um, it allows you to register the trademark in foreign countries. So if you want to register, you know, if NBC wanted to register their trademark in Spain, they'd first have to register it in the U.S. Um, and then you can put the little R symbol. So how many of you have seen the little R symbol versus the TM symbol? This is the distinction with copyright. For copyright, you can put the C sign up or you can leave it off. It, you know, if it's left off, it doesn't mean that it's not copyright protected, and if you put it on, it doesn't mean you've registered it with the Copyright Office. In order to use the R symbol, it means that it's federally registered with the USPTO. If someone has not registered something with the USPTO, but they still want to claim trademark rights, they'll use the little TM sign. So if you want to come up with a logo or a new phrase, you can use the TM sign immediately, but you can't use this R symbol, because that's limited to federally registered trademarks. So as I said two slides ago, in order for it to be a trademark, it has to be distinctive and identify, let me see the, the words exact, used in commerce and distinctive. So this is a chart to help someone understand what do we mean when we say distinctive? Well, there are categories of marks. They range from arbitrary and fanciful to generic. And if a mark is arbitrary and fanciful, then it means it has strong trademark protection. But if the mark is generic, it means it has no trademark protection. So examples of arbitrary and fanciful trademarks would be Kodak, Exxon, Starbucks, Fandango. And the reason is these words don't really mean anything other than to identify the company that produces these goods or services. Um, and even Apple, because no one would normally associate the, the name Apple with a computer except for the company, right? And so they've established a very strong trademark because it's an arbitrary or fanciful name that they've used for their mark. On the other end of the spectrum, you have generic marks. Shredded wheat. Well, shredded wheat is really just shredded wheat, right? So um, they can't register that mark. Another one is escalator. It used to be registered, 
but then everyone started using the, the word escalator for that device that goes up and down, and so it lost registration because it became generic. Um, hot pot and aspirin, these are all examples of marks that have become generic. Um, another one is thermos. Thermos used to be a, a, a trademark for a particular company, a particular brand, but now everyone uses the word thermos to mean a container that you hold liquid in or, you know, to keep it warm or cold. So it's generic, it doesn't get any protection. In the middle, you have suggestive marks, such as copper tone or Tums or Tide, where it might be able to give you some idea of what the product is, but it's still registerable. And then you have merely descriptive marks, Vision Center, American Airlines. These marks wouldn't normally be trademark protected, but they've acquired some secondary meaning to apply directly. When people hear American Airlines now, they're not thinking of just an airline in America, they're thinking of the company, American Airlines. So this just gives a, an idea of how things get registered. Not everything can get um, trademark registration. There are additional marks that also can't get registered, in addition to the generic marks. Marks that are descriptive, that have not attained secondary meaning, they also can't be registered. Um, immoral or scandalous marks can't be registered. There's actually a case before the Supreme Court, um, they had a hearing on it a couple of weeks ago, so we're kind of waiting on this ruling. Um, it's by a band called The Slants, and The Slants is a band of Asian Americans, and they chose the name The Slants. Um, they wanted to reappropriate a name that would otherwise be um, offensive, and they wanted to take it back and turn it into something less offensive. Well, they wanted to register the name, and the, cop, the um, USPTO said, no, this, this mark is it's immoral, it's scandalous. So it's now before the Supreme Court to, say what, to see whether they can, in fact, register the mark. Um, another case that uh, has implications based on this lawsuit is the Redskins. They had trademark registration. Um, they have kind of lost it at this point. And depending on how the court rules in this case, Redskins may be able to be trademarked or it may not. So the court, the USPTO can decide, hey, this mark is too offensive for us to register and grant benefits to. Um, other marks that can't be registered are marks that are primarily surnames or geographic indicators, and then marks that are likely to cause confusion to people, um, which also is a basis for a mark being um, infringing on another mark. So we'll talk about that one. Trademark rights can also be lost. They can be lost by abandonment if someone stops using the name. Um, through non-use or the intent not to use. They can be lost if you improperly license someone else to use your mark or you improperly assign it. And this is um, something we'll talk about in, when we come to talk about marks that the church owns. And then it can also be lost to generis genericity, which is, again, when a mark becomes generic because everyone's using it. Instead of describing the particular brand, they're describing a particular product and not the, the brand of the product. So the church also has protected marks. The General Conference owns a number of trademarks, including Seventh-day Adventist, the name Adventist, and our church logo. In addition to that, though, we own marks such as For Faith for Today, Grace Link, Sunscreen, The Hope Channel, It Is Written, and we also help register marks for North American Division and also for some of their um, ministries. That's why It Is Written is there. They're their own corporation, but we register marks for them and keep them updated. So let's talk about trademark infringement. Trademark infringement is the unauthorized use of a registered trademark or, one, or the use of a mark that is confusingly similar to it. And that's usually where we come in to having issues, if a mark is confusingly similar um, on the registered goods and services, um, and sometimes even for dissimilar goods and services. The short answer is it's someone using someone else's mark without permission. Here are some examples. So, you know, you have five-hour energy. Well, some companies said, hey, let's make a six-hour energy, and let's use the exact same colors, the exact same bottle, the exact same images. That did not work. That was found to be infringing, okay? They have Starbucks, and then someone said, hey, we're going to have Boulder coffee, but they used the same feel. So if someone saw it quickly, they think, oh, there's a Starbucks, but really it's Boulder coffee. Down here, I don't know if you can see this image. It looks like Cheerios. It's not Cheerios. It's crispy oats. Um, again, that's infringing. Um, another Starbucks example, but this one was actually found to be okay because it's in another country and they registered their trademark first. Um, so they actually have the rights to use the mark still. And then here's another one, enjoy Chica Loca. 
Um, it doesn't even sound like Coca-Cola, but it, the, the, the font of the lettering that they used and the color that they used was enough to say, hey, you can't do that. Um, and then McDowell's. It doesn't matter if this was going to be for selling cars or selling bicycles, because it's so similar to McDonald's. Um, it doesn't even have to be for the same goods and services. It's just infringing. Like, they, they can't do that. Um, here are some more infringing marks. Do these look familiar at all? Do you know what they're infringing on? They're infringing on the church's logo. Um, all of these are actually like SDA entities, but when we license out the use of our mark, we, we don't allow people to alter the mark because that becomes confusing to people. And it also lessens our, the strength of our mark because a mark can lose its federal trademark um, designation. So we are very strict in how we license the use of our marks. So let's talk about how we um, use trademarks by the church. So it's governed by a general conference working policy. And churches, conferences, unions, and entities that are in the church yearbook, they can use the mark. Not for commercial purposes, but they're, they're entitled to use the mark. That's in working policy. For lay organizations and other individuals, permission has to be given by the general conference corporation. And it has to be given prior to use, and it has to be in writing. And that permission is at the GC's discretion. And there are a number of requirements and policy that have to be met. Um, those include that the, you know, if it's for an organization, the organization has to be run by Seventh-day Adventists. It has to be used in a way that's consistent with the church's teachings. Um, it cannot be used for commercial or for-profit um, reasons. And also, we don't allow people to change up our logo it lessens the strength. So we're very strict on that. If we see people that are using the logo in a way that is not within um, policy, you will probably get an email or a phone call from me or a letter from me. I'm doing it in love. <laughs> I'm just asking you to comply and please you know, take down the infringing mark. So there's also a logo style guide that um, I think was prepared by a communications department. And there may be a new one coming out because they've made some slight changes to the logo. But again, in order to maintain the, incredit, the integrity, um, it's important to avoid any treatment that will weaken or distort the visual strength of the logo. In this case, they use the word of the signature. So they do allow some creative latitude, um, and they list what that creative latitude is in the policy. And you can find that policy um, online on the GC website. They're, they're, they give a lot of guidance as far as how big, what colors to use, um, how to use it in conjunction with the church's name or a school's name. So they, they do give guidance, and if you have questions, you can always reach out to the communications um, people there at the GC, or reach out to me, and I will then get you in contact with the um, people there. But some, one element here is it says elements must not be added to or subtracted from the symbol, and so that's what gets these logos in trouble, because they took elements away from the, the whole, and then they put it into their own, or they added elements into the church's logo. That's what makes it inappropriate here. And that actually is my entire presentation. I think I tried to condense it down as, as quickly as possible, but hopefully you all have some questions, and we can talk about those um, over lunch. <laughs>